In chapter 3, we're going to talk about the selection process. And it's important to know that many times at the entry level firefighter during the selection process, you're competing with one, two, or even 300 individuals just for a small number of spots. So you need to do something to make yourself stand out. And in this chapter, we're going to examine the various phases that you could experience and how to help you stand out over the rest of the applicants. Of course, by taking this class and working on your degree or diploma, you're doing that already. So let's see how we can make you get the cutting edge. So let's review our objectives. First, list the standard phases of the hiring process. Describe the importance of preparation in the selection process. Give examples of body gestures that can be interpreted in an interview. Explain the purpose and importance of the probationary period. The job of a firefighter can be a very demanding career, not only physically, but mentally as well. So it's very important that the fire service as a whole have a very stringent recruiting process in terms of their hiring. So they're going to test you physically, mentally, and your cognitive abilities. Because they don't want to waste time on you if you're not going to be able to complete the training. So when you're looking for a firefighter job, start looking at postings. And you can find your postings primarily on the website, sometimes local newspapers, or maybe they'll have a banner or sign up outside the fire station, or they may be even local job or career fairs. I often tell individuals, look at a map where you live and draw a circle around the area to see you know, how far you're willing to travel to go to work on a daily basis. Once you draw that circle, start looking around in that area and start Googling or looking at the departments in that area, such as county departments and city departments. As you may or may not know, there are a lot of city departments within the county. Take our neighbor Walton County, for example. They have three city to fire departments as well as a county department. So you have the city of Social Circle, the city of Monroe, and the city of Loganville, which all operate independently and will have their own hire department, their own hirings, shall we say, for their department independent of, say, Walton County. Even though they do work together on fire scenes, they are separate entities. Other places you can look, such as colleges and community events, oftentimes they'll have jobs posted, as well as I send out anytime I get notification, I'll send it out to the rank and file of the individuals taking classes and let them know. And there are other paid places that will send out subscriptions that have lists of upcoming uh, firefighter examinations and things of that nature. Um, obviously, Indeed is one uh, website that people use a lot. Strategic Government Resources is another. Um, firefighter Jobs is another. But uh, I really just recommend a lot of times these government entities just posted on their own job board. So again, look at the cities and the counties you're wanting to. Look at the HR section and, and look at their websites to see when they're accepting applications. It's always a, a good idea when you get ready to apply to a department that is hiring is to do some research on that department. Try to talk to professionals in that department and see what you can learn about it. Become familiar with the requirements and what they do and don't do, as well as their hiring process as a whole. Look at the prerequisites. Notice that the job application process and deadlines. Make sure you abide by these deadlines and a lot of times, that's a test. Everything is a test, usually in the hiring process, where they'll say, you know, apply by this date, and then they'll reply back and say, thank you, we've received your application. 
typically submit the required documents by a certain date. So they may ask you for such things as a criminal history report from your local sheriff's department, a driving history report, and a lot of times they're going to ask for a seven-year driving history report. Well, what if you've only been driving for three years, which may be the case. However, the instruction said seven years. So when you go to the DMV, request a seven year driving history, because that's their attention to detail in terms of following direction. They may ask you for a copy of your driver's license and they may say they want a color copy. And if you submit a black and white copy, that's not what they want and they're gonna kick you out of the process and you will not be able to move on. And this goes back to attention to detail. Again, everything is a test, so make sure that you follow it to a T. If they ask you to show up somewhere at a certain time, make sure you're there early and not late. Otherwise, they may not let you in, and they will ask you to come back and apply next year. Often, one of the first steps in the process is a written test. And these written tests vary from department to department. Sometimes they can be a written test based on some general firefighter information, or it can be just some sort of cognitive test that measures your ability to read a paragraph, answer questions, uh, do simple math calculations, things of that nature, as well as situational questions. Um, which has a little bit of a, a personality profile to it. And in this week's assignment, you will have a practice written test to complete from Fire Protection Selection Services that I posted on the website. Again, I'm not grading it for accuracy. I'm going to grade it on completion. So I want you to answer every question as best you can. And then after the deadline and everyone's turned in the assignment, I'll go ahead and post the test again with the correct answers so you can see how you do. So that gives you a good idea of a written test that's used in the surrounding departments. Upon successful completion of the written test, they're going to have a whole list of what they call qualified or potentially qualified candidates and they're going to invite those individuals to a physical ability slash agility test and this test can vary from department to department sometimes you have departments that'll do basic physical requirements such as a two mile run push-ups and sit-ups in two minutes and things of that nature but that became a little bit of um, a legality issue um, for some departments because individuals were questioning the hiring process saying, you know, when am I ever going to run two miles on a fire scene? What does push-ups have to do with it? And they had a hard time actually linking it to the job on a daily basis. So what they came up with after that is a skills-based test that mimics tasks that you will do on the fire ground such as dragging a dummy because you would drag a person to safety and those dummies can range anywhere from 150 to 200 pounds and then you have to drag them between 75 and 150 feet you can have such things as dragging a charged hose line uh, simulating cutting down a door with an axe so they'll have you hit a sled or a piece of wood so many times they'll have you raise an extension ladder and they'll have you do this in a very specific way like a hand over hand method and if you don't follow the directions to a T again that'll kind of kick you out of the process they may even have you climb a ladder an aerial device that's 95 or 100 feet in the air of course you'll be tied off and secure but what they're checking for is are you scared of heights they may require you to wear a mask for a certain period of time an scba mask and that can kind of be claustrophobic because a lot of times they'll put a hood over your head and kind of black out the mask and again what they're checking for is to see if you have claustrophobia a good example and there's several videos of the test 
in uh, this week's lesson is the CPAP or the Certified Physical Agility Test. And this is a very demanding test. Um, it does have a high fail rate, but a lot of paid departments like City of Atlanta and uh, Athens used to uh, use this CPAP test. So I highly encourage you to watch the video on it and see, are you ready for this challenge? Because it can be very daunting. Okay, here's some food for thought. Why is it important for fire departments to develop and implement medical and physical fitness standards that apply equally to all firefighters based on the duties they are expected to perform? So, should a female firefighter be able to do the same thing as a male firefighter? Thoughts on that, gang? You may have an essay question on that later, so think about it. If so, why or why not? After the physical agility test, a lot of times they'll do an interview. An interview can be very, very intimidating. So let's go over some things that will help you out with the interview process. First, do your homework and practice before the interview. Have an update and properly develop resume, highlighting your skills and ability that would be applicable to the fire service. When I say do your homework, look at the fire department, know things about it, know stuff about the chief, their community involvement, how many stations they have, uh, do they run an ambulance service, uh, do they not, do they just have firefighters and no EMS personnel in the station. Also, try to find individuals that work for that department or people that have been through the hiring process and see what types of questions they ask. Are they situational questions? Or are they the routine, why do you want to be a firefighter? And you can Google fire department interview questions and you come up with a whole list. And it's a good idea to practice answering these questions. And what I mean by practice is a lot of times they'll bring you into a room, they'll put you at the end of a table, you'll be surrounded by four or five individuals and they will take turns asking you questions and you would need to answer the questions appropriately. Now, I did say something earlier I wanna go back and talk a little bit more on. Situational questions. A lot of fire departments now are starting to give scenario-based questions to individuals. And there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer because they don't expect you to know the right answer if you're not in the fire service. But what they're looking for is, do you understand the question are you able to articulate your answer completely and explain why you would do things that way? So for example, you're on the fire scene. Your officer tells you to go back to the truck and get an ax to help force the door. While en route back to the fire engine to retrieve the ax, another lieutenant that is of equal rank to your officer on another engine tells you that the fire is getting out of control and you need to grab a hose line and apply it to the AB corner and you need to do that now. What do you do and why? So that's a good example of a situational question. You have two conflicting orders. You have your immediate supervisor that wants you to get an ax to force this door. You have another person of equal rank that is not your immediate supervisor telling you to do a job to help extinguish the fire. What do you do and why? A lot of times after you get done with the initial interview, you may have what's known as a fire chief's interview and that's kind of independent. And that's where the fire chief asks you their own questions in regards to determining your suitability for their department as a job as a firefighter. Again, do your homework on the fire department, know all you can about the community and the fire department as a whole, and be prepared to answer simple questions like, 
why do you want to be a firefighter here? Why do you want to be a firefighter, period? Have you applied to other fire departments? What were the results? Here's some more great sample interview questions. Describe your work history and experience. Describe credentials you hold that will qualify you for this job. Education, certificates, etc. So you could list, I have an associate's degree in fire science from Athens Technical College. I have CPR certification. Um, I'm currently taking an EMT class, whatever the case may be. With the major strengths, apply to the fire service. What are some core values that the fire service holds? What are good qualities to have for a firefighter? Another question that has been used in the fire service that individuals have a hard time answering a lot of times is, what is your definition of integrity? And why is it important? With strengths, they're always going to ask about your weaknesses. What do you consider development areas that you could do to improve yourself? What are your biggest weaknesses? What characteristics do you feel make a good supervisor? Um, I always hated this question here at the bottom, but describe a conflict you experienced with a previous supervisor and how it was resolved. That one comes up more often than not when talking to firefighters going through the process. I love the attendance question here. What do you feel is a satisfactory attendance record? And an important thing to note and keep in mind, most fire departments work 24 hours on, 48 hours off, and they do that 24-7, 365, without regards to holidays, weekends, anniversaries, etc. Now saying that, it's important to note that at 7 o'clock or 7.30, whatever the shift time change is, people are ready to go home. They've been there for 24 hours. So it's a good idea not to come walking in the door at, you know, 7 o'clock right at shift change time or five minutes before. I always recommend individuals on this to be at the station 30 minutes early. And there's a couple of reasons for this at minimum. Now, some people get there an hour, it just depends. What happens if you run into traffic or there's an accident or things of that nature? They're expecting you to be there on time regardless of the situation. If there's a blizzard, you need to make plans to get there somehow, some way, whether it's spending the night at the station on the night before the storm or securing some reliable transportation, four wheel drive, etc. Now, when you get there early, this is a great time to get with a shift that is going off and you hear about their day and about your engine and equipment. What's going on with the department? What piece of equipment may be acting up or needs to be looked at? What did they use? What did they not use? Uh, things of that nature that you may need to take a closer eye at. Another question is, how do you define pressure? And how well do you perform in that type of situation? Again, this is a very demanding job. They're looking to see how are you going to react. So for example, if somebody being a patient on an EMS call spits in your face that's a, a drunk, maybe they try to hit you, what would you do? Do you consider that a pressure situation? Some more questions here. In what type of work environment do you excel? And a good thing to note is when you think about the answer, the fire department is a, a paramilitary organization. So there is a good bit of structure and they don't particularly care for um, people that are, are freelancers, meaning they, they go out and do their own thing. Um, when you do that on a fire scene, it could cause somebody to get hurt or injured or even killed, especially yourself. 
So you want to think about, you know, team environments, good construction, um, things of that nature. Another question here. Tell me about a time when you had to go above and beyond the call of duty in order to get a job done. And what they're looking for here is a chance for you to really toot your own horn. Again, what makes you better than the other two, three hundred people applying for this job? And I'm not telling you to make things up. You, you actually want it to be factual. But, you know, when did you have a task to do that you really just sunk your teeth in? You, you spent the extra time. You went above what was required and, and you made it happen. And, and it's always a good idea to pick something that you're very passionate about. Now, when you're answering these questions, it's very important to pay attention to your body language. Experts say that over 80% of our communication is done through body language, such as posture. Are you sitting upright in the chair? Are you slouching? Are your arms crossed, meaning that you're in a defensive kind of protective mode? Are your arms wailing around being too much of a distraction? And I do admit, I, I talk with my hands, so to speak, meaning I move them around. But is it too much or too little? Eye contact. Are you looking the individuals in the eye as you're answering the question? Is there any nodding going on? And this can be on both sides of the table, meaning are you nodding that you're understanding the question? Are the interviews nodding, meaning that they're understanding what you're saying? Or they can be very flaccid or stoic and not doing anything, and that really makes you nervous. But again, trained interviewers are taught not to make any gestures to indicate a right or wrong answer. So they really try to control their body language. Smile. Lean closer when somebody asks you a question. And these are all signs of active listening, meaning that you are really focused and trying to hear and understand what they're saying. Of course, we talked about gestures. And don't interrupt, but it's also important to know that if you don't understand something, you can and should ask for clarification. Or maybe you need them to repeat the question because you didn't fully understand it. That's totally okay and acceptable. Now, this one is a big pet peeve of mine. I've said on many interview panels in my tenure, but dress for success. Wear a suit and tie. Wear a coat. Look professional. You know, they say always dress for one level higher than you're applying for. Ladies, again, dress nicely. Don't be like certain individuals I've interviewed in the past. Um, I had an individual that showed up wearing, you know, shorts and a t-shirt, wearing flip-flops, and that's not very professional at all. It, it comes across to the interview panel that you don't take the job serious and, and that, you know, you're very lackadaisical and just really don't care. Uh, be well groomed, you know, fingernails, clean shaven, or if you've got a beard or a mustache, uh, make sure it's well trimmed. Don't look like you just rolled out of bed and got off a drunken bender from the night before. Shake hands. It's always important to me to shake the panel's interviewer's hand before and after introducing yourself and then thanking them for your time. And on a side note, don't bring your parents to the interview. Uh, believe it or not, I, I did, uh, in my tenure, had an individual that had a family member there with them. And uh, the family member wanted to kind of go in and uh, help talk up their son. Doesn't look good with the interview panel. So after you survive the grueling interview process you will give, be given a conditional job offer. So that says, hey, we want you here working for us at XYZ Fire Department, and 
we're going to give you this job upon successful completion of usually a drug screen, some sort of medical exam, or quite possibly a psychological and a polygraph test. In the medical exam, they're looking for um, are you colorblind? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have anything medically that could affect you on a fire scene that could be detrimental to yourself or others? And then, of course, the drug screen. Uh, you know whether or not you're going to pass that, so um, make sure you don't waste anyone's time. The next phase, and a lot of times the, these conditional offers can kind of be done in different phases. They may send half to a medical and the other half to like uh, an official background section. And what they're going to do in this point is go ahead and make sure that the references, uh, your work references are checked, your personal references are checked. Have a good idea um, what people are going to say about you before you put them down as a reference. And you may also want to give them a heads up and let them know that you put them down on a reference, especially if it's been a minute since you've talked to them. Again, driving record, they may pull it if they haven't already, or they may confirm your driving history, and they may go nationwide. And a lot of times they do that with a criminal history. Uh, they'll actually fingerprint you, and then they'll look through the federal and the state databases to see if you had anything on your history that wasn't previously reported. And then of course the polygraph test and this can vary very daunting, very intimidating. Uh, for example, when I was in charge of the hiring process at Rockdale, we would send individuals to the GBI overall Panthersville Road and they would administer the polygraph test. <coughs> and a lot of times the polygraph will tell you this is basically kind of like a, um, an enhanced interrogation. So what they're doing is asking you a series of questions out of a predetermined book, and you'll fill the book out prior to going in there. And it'll ask things about undetected criminal history, your job history, drug use, you name it. And what I tell people is make sure you're upfront and honest and let the chips fall where they may. And these departments understand that People have passed and no one's perfect, but are you going to be honest about it? And many times, you know, even with a checkered pass, so to speak, they're willing to give you a chance, provided you've had a significant amount of time where you've been out of trouble, so to speak. But again, be honest about it. Other things they may check is social media. And that's a big thing now, guys, because if you want to be in the fire service, you're in a position of trust. So they hold you to a higher standard. So be careful what you put on social media, okay? Um, don't put on there, hey, you know, getting tore up on a Friday night and puking in the bushes and, and all this kind of stuff. You want to be very professional because this can really turn people off towards you saying that, you know what, that conduct is not acceptable for a firefighter and they call that conduct unbecoming. So even after you get the job, you really want to monitor what you put out there for people to see. Even though it's not happening on duty, they expect you to be a pillar of the community. There was a case where a fire chief, and I forget where it was, was sitting behind the wheel of a car. The door was open, and it appeared to be at a barbecue, and he was holding a beer in his hand, and it was posted on a social media site. And that fire chief ended up losing his job. Even though he wasn't actively driving the car, uh, it gave the impression that you know he was drinking and driving, and the municipality fired him for conduct unbecoming. Now, I did mention earlier psychological tests, and it's not listed here, but a lot of departments now want to make sure that emotionally you can handle the rigor of the job, because do you understand? You're going to see people that are hurt and injured, often due to car wrecks, fires, or even abuse. 
So they want to make sure that you're going to be able to handle these emotional stresses. So they'll send you to a psychological test. And a lot of times you'll sit down for a psychologist for an hour. They'll ask you some generic questions. And they'll even give you a personality test and things of that nature. And count on spending a, a good day with these folks. And a lot of times the tests that they give you prior to are about 300 questions of, excuse the expression, do you like your mother? Do you love your mother? You know, do you love your mother? Do you hate your mother? Um, and it's kind of vague, so don't ask me how they interpret it, but again, try to be consistent in your answers and, and go through it. And then the results will basically tell the employee, or excuse me, the employer, stuff about your character. Do you have tendencies for drug and alcohol abuse? Are you a team player? Uh, are you a loner? Um, a little bit more about your personal history, things of that nature. But the psychologist is going to have about a six page report on you that they do. Everything from your history, likes, dislikes, and your tendencies based on the interview and testing. So again, just be honest and let the chips fall where they may is your best course of action. And they're going to basically recommend or not recommend or recommend with reservations. Uh, meaning that, yeah, we're not so sure they could be a good employee if you want to give them a chance. Now, after you complete this, this entire process, let's say that you didn't make it in the top 12. And a lot of times, as I said, they'll do, hey, we'll give you a job provided that you complete all the medical tests. Well, let's say that you were stopped right there. And they say, okay, we like you, we don't have a spot for you right now, so we're going to put you on our list of eligible to be hired. And basically what that means is in the next six months or 12 months, depending on whatever it is, if they have one, that they're going to go back down this list and they're going to continue the hiring process with that medical phase and then put you to work. So what you're hoping is somebody retires, resigns, or, or doesn't make it through the training process, and then you'll be in line for the next phase. After you start work, you're going to be on a probationary period. And that's usually three months to 12 months, and a lot of times it's a year for the fire service because what you got to understand is when you walk in the door, especially if you have no experience, they're going to put you through a recruit school. During that recruit school, you're going to learn the job of a firefighter and often the times of an EMT. And this recruit school could last anywhere between three and six months depending on the department and their requirements and needs. So you'll be there, you know, Monday through Friday, 8 to 4, 40 hours a week. At the end of that period, say that six-month period, now you're finally going to be put on shift. And again, that's kind of why their hiring process is so critical and, and stringent because they want to make sure that you're going to make it through that hiring process. You can handle the training. You have the cognitive ability to pass the test. And, and you're somewhat physically fit so you can do the job. But again, at the end of that process, you're finally getting put to work. So during that phase is how are you actually going to act on the job? How are you actually going to do as a firefighter? So that's where that second, you know, six months come into play. And it gives them time to accurately gauge your ability and see if you're going to be a good employee for them. Often during this period, you'll be assigned a mentor and they'll kind of walk you through you know, the shift life and help you and ensure that you've got all your basic firefighting skills down. It is important to remember during a probationary period, you can be terminated for anything and any reason. So uh, don't screw up, you know, don't be late. And uh, a lot of times I say, uh, don't rock the boat, so to speak. You know, do your job and do it well. Exceed your boss's expectations. So to take it full circle, looking at things that help you stand out in the hiring process. Do you have EMT? Do you have EMTA or paramedic? Especially if you're applying at a service that runs an ambulance. This is something that's highly desirable because that cuts down on the amount of time they have to train you. 
so they can put you to work quicker filling holes on shift and they're basically not paying you uh, or excuse me they're basically not having to pay you to sit in class where they're not getting any quote work out of you so to speak do you have firefighter one or other certifications or a higher degree such as your associates do you volunteer anywhere as a firefighter are you bilingual so again these are all things to help make you stand out make sure you have a good driving record and what I mean by good driving record is they're going to look and see do you have any DUIs do you have numerous speeding tickets things of that nature stuff that shows um, that you engage in you know risky behavior um, and that's kind of the stuff that they're not really looking for you know do you have good physical fitness if you haven't already start exercising do some push-ups sit-ups uh, climb stairs uh, go for a run really work on your cardio and your upper body strength and of course uh, diversity is something they also look for um, are you a member of the community do you mimic the community uh, sorry guys hate to tell you but they're always looking for more ladies in the fire service uh, and of course social media be careful about it okay some more food for thought questions what is your definition of diversity how does it affect your everyday life why is it important to have diversity in the fire service and what are the benefits of having a diversified workforce in the fire emergency service field and you know you were looking at ethnicity race gender um, age cultural backgrounds things of that nature okay so let's recap some key ideas departments have the responsibility to find the most qualified applicants during the hiring process candidates should prepare themselves to become members of the fire department team by being prepared the job market is expected to grow for fire departments in the future so if you have any questions you can email me at a roberts at athens tech dot edu or you can reach me in my office at 706-357-0162 or again you can look in blackboard at the calendar for the course and you can see my virtual office hours where we can meet and have Q&A to discuss things in the prior week and blackboard collaborate hope you guys all have a good day and make sure you get your review questions done thank you